today, this afternoon, what we're going to focus on is the challenges of research. What our history is, where we come from, what was done in the, in the 60s, where the Harvard research began, what led out of that. Uh, Robert will talk to us about European research and what's happening in other cultures, other Western cultures, and then Mark will sort of synthesize and talk about how it's all seen by the government and suggestions for us if we would like to make progress with the government as opposed to against the government. So I'd like to open up this afternoon's program with Timothy Laird. Sisters, 
I'm sure you're aware of the fact that we in this room belong to a, a long, long and honorable uh, chain of uh, visionary explorers and uh, brain navigators and uh, mystics who have gone as far within as uh, they could. Uh, just in this country, though, know, uh, this is the third the third psychedelic revolution that our country's been through. I must pay tribute to uh, uh, the people that we got to know by history at Harvard. The second psychedelic revolution took place, or started at Cambridge around the turn of the century. William James yeah. founded the first psychological laboratory in this country. He wrote that incredible book, uh, The Varieties of Religious wow. Experience. Uh, uh, that was uh, nitrous oxide, hashish and opium. Oliver <laughs> <laughs> Wendell Holmes, you know. Uh, I think we must pay tribute uh, to, uh, as we always do, to the writers like uh, Ginsburg and William Burroughs. But uh, in the second uh, revolution, Mark Twain was probably the most outspoken uh, advocate of brain navigation. Indeed, he taught uh, Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, into uh, getting a little uh, uh, neurological assistance. Grant, you know, was writing his uh, autobiography, he needed money, and he had a terrible lot of writer's block, so uh, uh, Mark Twain uh, got a doctor to prescribe uh, cocaine for him, and uh, thus the world got uh, uh, <laughs> Ulysses S. Grant autobiography. <laughs> I suppose I've mentioned things like cocaine, so I won't. Uh, uh, I'm not a great fan of cocaine. So as William Burroughs said to me about a month ago, that I don't like any drug that makes me twitch. <laughs> so we had the first uh, psychedelic revolution in this country, and again, started in Cambridge. Uh, the enemy of the second, uh, we've got, uh, we've got uh, our uh, War on Drugs Now, the enemy uh, that uh, William James is crew faced with is Women's Christian Temperance Union. <laughs> and of course, the first revolution which took place uh, in Cambridge, the enemy then was uh, people like Cotton Mather and the Salem Witchcraft uh, Trials, and then later came Ralph Waldo Emerson, who in very close touch, uh, Michael Horowitz can, uh, can give you the uh, fingerprints and dates and all of this, he's a very close touch. Uh, with the uh, psychedelic poets in England at the time. Margaret Fuller, probably the founder of women's liberation in this uh, country. Uh, Ashish and opium. <laughs> <laughs> Michael uh, and Cindy delighted me about a month ago when they quoted text uh, line of one of my great heroes, uh, Thoreau, David Henry Thoreau. Uh, but interesting, you know, he went to jail for passive, nonviolent resistance to the government of Washington, D.C. And by the time when Emerson came and said, what are you doing in there? And he says, what are you doing out there, Ralph? Uh, <laughs> you know why he was in jail? I mean, this is talking about deja vu again. He was in jail for not paying a tax to have gone to support the Mexican War. <laughs> so this long series of warfares, holy warfares of the industrial workers against the vegetable growers of the South. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, oh, Thoreau, by the way, it was uh, it was ether. <laughs> I'm not advocating. He's very kind about if you want to visit the stars, try ether. <laughs> Would we be here, or would we be here in this moment of exaltation and sense of positive growth oh, if we had not had in the last six months the probably the six most glorious months in human history? Yeah. Me, we all feel it, uh, and I know uh, when you saw the, the video shots coming from Tiananmen Square, and you saw 100,000, 300,000, 1 million young Chinese students. And you saw that look in their eye, that wood stock lean. <laughs> and you saw them with the headbands and the beat sign. And they had the old Abby Hoffman trick. Uh, they turned it for, for televisions. They knew how to play the cameras. <laughs> they were throwing the flowers at the tanks and saying, so do we love you? I mean, uh, and then of course the Berlin Wall coming down. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the last 
uh, Bob Beth and I had a wonderful uh, um, Christmas uh, phone call, and we both shared our joy that in a small way, and in a sense a larger way, uh, everything we've been doing was part of the evolution of youth, the new breed that brought that wall down, uh, because it was individual freedom. I personally uh, would give the, you know, giving out Academy Oscars for who brought the wall down, I would name three wonderful prophets of our time that influenced me and that I was fortunate enough to meet. Uh, the first of all, of course, was Benjamin Spock. <laughs> Benjamin Spock taught quantum psychology. He said to the parents, treat your kids as individuals. I mean, that's the most powerful, powerful thing we've ever made, preparing us for the information age when you have to climb into your brain. There's only one person who can run a brain, and that's the individual. Uh, the second person, uh, who is not an American, is a, um, is a Swiss gentleman, and also a doctor. <laughs> Dr. Spock and Dr. Hoffman, I mean... <laughs> one of the great organic chemists of our time. Uh, we all know that he was a very deeply cultured man with a deep uh, roots in the tradition of the German and Swiss and European mysticism so that uh, he just didn't happen to uh, ride that funny bicycle home that day and think it was a psychiatric episode. <laughs> he would seen the guidebooks. He knew what was going on. Uh, um, <laughs> there was a wonderful tribute for uh, Albert, remember? Uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, Hollywood, big St. James Club, and all these people were out there, all dressed up in Sunday night. Oh, and uh, yeah. I was thinking, like, saying, you know, Hoffman wrote a book called L.I.C. My Problem Child. And I said, Albert, they're your children. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, third, who's the third person to mention? Third doctor. Uh, Marshall McLuhan. Because, uh, number one, Marshall McLuhan was always a strong supporter of the psychedelic uh, movement in this country in the 60s. He actually told me, his, uh, he gets, I get credit, it was his uh, script by him, he, uh, he, he told me the, uh, you know, the words that turn out you know, to be the American translation of Glasnost and Perestroika. He said, Timothy, tell him, turn on, tune in and drop out. <laughs> <laughs> There's a fourth person, too. What? Timothy, there's a fourth person. Who's that? Timothy Leary. Oh, wow. yeah. uh, uh, there's no news to you, there's a war on drugs out there. Uh, in the history of religious religious insanity and holy wars, I think uh, this one takes the cake. I mean, the absolute... You know, we would hire it after about a year if we were going to have trouble with uh, uh, the taboo against the brain, the brain. You're not supposed to tamper with the brain in an industrial society. And we found that out right away. Uh, many times after a while, we'd sit around and we'd say, well, you know, these psychedelic drugs are psychotomimetic. They create serious... Uh, Mental confusion, paranoia, hysterical um, uh, hallucinations uh, in deans and government officials who have not taken it. <laughs> one thing is true, of course, in a war, there's no more insult propaganda. And the one, one weapon we have, and we're going to talk about what's going to happen. By the way, my script is very positive. <laughs> uh, evolution did work for two billion years to create the human brain with its wonderful receptor sites. <laughs> to let people like Czar Bennett <laughs> and his ill stop it all. Uh, yeah. uh, each of us in our own way have to follow Orwell's uh, uh, basic prescription, in times of big brother insanity, your first job is to remain sane yourself. Oh. Number two, look around and you'll find uh, there are a lot of people with twinkling eyes that are sane with you. Uh, but each of us has to uh, do this in our own way. Uh, when Rick said to me, he hoped I would give advice as to how we could get government permission 
<laughs> do research on psychedelic drugs. You know, I mean, I, uh, I'm definitely uh, beyond the, the government permission situation. <laughs> the government in this <laughs> But also, well, one way I found to get common sense. Common sense. Common sense is so important. I'll give you three little common sense things you can do. Um, I was on a radio program talking in Tulum, in Mississippi, Alabama, and some of you talk about marijuana, you know, they say marijuana kills, and I said, you know, marijuana is uh, really not very dangerous. It's the least dangerous thing around. And this old farm guy says that, well, I'd like to talk to you, Dr. Larry. He said, you said marijuana is not dangerous. It, it serves to injure my son, Billy. Oh, gee, I'm sorry. What happened to Billy? Well, the damn fool went out in the barn and made a mistake, and I have a ton that landed on his arm. <laughs> It's uh, happened in Soviet Union, it's happening here. Uh, I got on fax, I got about five copies of another advertisement. Same idea, white face. It's a plate now, and on this plate is a fried egg with two pieces of bacon and some toast. <laughs> this is your brain with bacon and buttered toast. <laughs> and understand that the people who run the industrial age and run the machinery, uh, they're in despair. It's all over. They know that that old thing is not going to work anymore. They're all out of jobs. I mean, for, for example, you know, when the wall went down, there's no more evil empire to fight. I was debating Jim Gordon Whitney two nights ago in Chicago, and I said, Gordon, I mean, he's not changed at all. He's still talking about America's a little old lady in a, in a, in a street, streets with these big guns around. I said, Gordon, um, as your friend, uh, I've got to intervene now. <laughs> I'll take you to the Betty Ford Clinic. Help us to break your, your gun habit. I mean, <laughs> severe entity deprivation. for millions of sincere people who, there's so many reasons, there are many reasons why there's this war on drugs. One is because they have to have some, the, the uh, Cromwellian Calvinist Protestants in this country have to have someone to, to war on. And, then, and so they got the war on drugs. But deeper than that, there are profound religious, religious issues here. And as Terry McKenna has told us so many times, in the old days, when it was all one, and we were all pagans, uh, the vegetables you'd be eating, cocoa leaves, and you'd be, and it was all part of nature, and there was no, you couldn't talk about uh, the individual, an individual brain, because there's no individual and no brain. Uh, in the industrial age, as you well know, uh, Richard, I can look back on it. Uh, now, you cannot allow people in an industrial, mass assembly, factory society to tamper with their brains. You simply can't allow it. This is why you have the robots. We're all here, the robot. You're a doctor, and I'm a lawyer, and you're a minister, and you're a professor, and you're, uh, you're a policeman, and you're a criminal. Sorry, but we have you too. But, uh, you've got a job. 
you can't have people traveling with their brains like robots suddenly uh, poking around inside. And so the, uh, as we move to the information age, the communication age, the meaning of the information age is, of course, the discovery of the brain. So I would say the year 2000, uh, the 21st century would be the century of the brain. And uh, I give credit to the great explorers of uh, Magellan and Columbus and Huxley and uh, 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 okay, so, uh, interesting, uh, Richard. Remember, uh, Alice Huxley used the metaphors of discovering uh, and going across to the antipodes and like Australian finding things and coming back. That uh, whole makes us so. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll go one more minute here. Uh, the thing is that uh, the brain has evolved over two billion years, and it's not our fault that the brain, DNA, decided that the brain needs certain psychoactive or brain activating plants and foods. I mean, there's been this wonderful symmetry and synergy between the plant kingdom and the uh, kingdom and the animal kingdom, to whatever you want to call it, uh, that the brain needs these uh, substances. Uh, I hate to break the news as our men, but uh, you know, uh, you've got the human brain uh, definitely uh, uh, not on your side in it. <laughs> four or five years, uh, the advanced underground psychedelic counterculture of the computer software industry, wow. many of whom are in this room right now, yeah. are producing something called artificial reality gear, yeah. virtual reality gear, I call it uh, electronic uh, software, W-A-R. These are you suits, you climb into a computer, you know about it, you put your goggles on, but the goggles are screens, and then you, 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 you produce uh, any kind of, uh, you create any reality you want. Should we meet for lunch? Should we meet in uh, Taj Mahal? Do we want to meet in the ski of the Samarit? What, 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 what do you got in your Samarit's file? Well, no, how about try this thing? We're going to be living, inhabiting, traveling in artificial reality. The very concept, artificial reality, I mean, isn't that thrilling? <laughs> A lot of people don't like the word artificial. A lot of people think that. A lot of people tell me drugs are artificial. You need marijuana, it's been around for 20,000 years to call that artificial. Um, all right, the artificial reality here is going to hook up with the psychedelic brain. Now, don't believe me. Believe the Wall Street Journal. Uh -huh. February 2nd, look it up, uh, um, February 2nd, front page, Wall Street Journal, column one, a big article about Jeremy Munir and virtual reality. And the headline said, electronic LSD question mark. That's a picture of Jeremy Munir and his red box. And the sixth, sixth paragraph down the first page, it quotes me as saying, yeah, this is better than LSD, it's addictive, but it's legal. <laughs> Same week, uh, Forbes magazine. Forbes. Your father would be proud of me. Yeah? Uh, article, same stuff. These new simulated artificial rallies are going to be more exciting. And it quotes me as saying again that uh, it's better uh, than LSD. Uh, these things, there's a genetic and historical thing going on here. There's no, no, not an accident that we started all this in the 60s when the baby boom who would have been television people, you know that. Uh, it's going to happen, win without us. Uh, I'll give you one tip, though. If you study the way the Republicans operate, when they start a war, they can't win. <laughs> what they do is they, they get elected by saying, we're going to fight that war. They get re-elected, as Nixon did, and we all knew, after Nixon got re-elected, then they're going to end the war. Now, Bush was elected, you know, and bro, he's not a wimp. Look what he did to Noriega. <laughs> Bush will be re-elected in 1992, and immediately he'll start making peace with us. <laughs> Besides, George Shook said it, the war on drugs is not good for business. <laughs> the question here is, 
What would I have done differently? <laughs> uh, let me think about it. Thank you very much. But it is clear now that a historically irreversible process has started. And that's exactly what happened in the 60s. A historically irreversible process started. It didn't really start there, as Tim pointed out. It, has, it goes way back in all of human history. But something did happen in the 60s that was prepared for by doors of perception, that was prepared for by the beats in the 50s, uh, something happened that was of no less moment than what has just happened in Eastern Europe and Tiananmen Square and so on. And we are all now cleaning up after it, not in a negative sense, but figuring out what to do with the fact that it happened. And we can hardly understand the implications of what it means in our lives. And we are sitting here often feeling like we are the downtrodden. And it's quite the reverse. We have figured out how it happened. And now, as people in, on the platform have said in the earlier panel, now it's up to each individual, one of us. The way Gandhi said, my life is my message. Now the way each of us lives makes a statement that it did work, that it did happen. I can't really any longer be frightened of the dragons of government. I can't really because I see how ephemeral and how paper tigerish they are. And I feel the fear in the culture. And I feel that the, what's required of us is interesting. I, I find myself in a funny position today because I'm I'm caught between um, Rick's desire for us to put forward a good face to be responsible researchers 
to play a part in the game of Western science. And I'm also, on the other side, seeing that what has happened is far more profound than that. Right. And that what we are doing now is trying to find a way to bring more people along through trying to legitimize our game in society. But the underground process in which psychedelics have continued to be used in society and have come into mainstream consciousness, that goes on independent of whether we lose or win on the front we're talking about in research. Because it was just in the same way as when we did the Good Friday study of Dr. Pankey, we were doing a double-blind placebo study, and all of us realized the absurdity of that. That the question of whether psychedelics was anything or not, for anybody who had taken them, it was quite an irrelevant question. And yet, that study was done, and it was a brilliant product of our days at Harvard, I think. I think that Walter, and Walter refused to take drugs until after he completed the study, so people wouldn't accuse him of what they accused us of, of sipping our own whiskey. <laughs> and I want to point out that in, um, in very recently, Rick here has done a follow-up of Walter Pankey's Good Friday study and has really gone back and found those people who turned on in Marsh Chapel at Boston University. And what he found were, was among the experimental group, the people that had psilocybin, long-term persisting effects included enhanced appreciation of life and nature, a deepening sense of joy, a commitment to their vocation, an enhanced appreciation of unusual experiences and emotions, increased tolerance of other religious systems, deepening equanimity in the face of difficult life crises, greater compassion for other people's minorities and nature, su increased subsequent participation in civil rights, anti-Vietnam, etc. Timeless eternity and death is not seen as fearful, as so fearful, therefore they are willing to take more risks. Now that is almost 30 years later of a group of minister students who took psilocybin in Marsh Chapel on Good Friday. And as you recall of the experimental subjects in the double-blind placebo study, nine of them had some criteria that would class that as a religious mystical experience. And in the control group, one of the ten had one of the nine criteria. In other words, it's not nothing. If you, you need it to be make sure to understand that. Now, I was asked to talk about um, what are the benefits of what we did in the 60s and what are our mistakes. Tim didn't deal with what he might have done differently. So, uh, but I can play the straight part, which I've done doing with Tim for years. <laughs> Here are the things that happened, as I can see it, from what started in that period. First of all, the culture broke out of the psycho psychotomimetic model of using chemicals. That up until then, in this society, primarily these chemicals were considered psychosis-inducing and under the control of the psychiatric establishment. These chemicals started to be seen, these herbs and plants, started to be seen as sacraments, as they are used in other societies. They were used for creative purposes, and the therapeutic possibilities started to become apparent. 
the chemicals in the early 60s among the 15 to 25 year olds became a rite of passage, which was shown in the Woodstock moment. In a culture very sadly lacking in rites of passage, where there is a lot of confusion about shift from childhood to maturity. <coughs> That period made us clear that it wasn't just the chemical you ingested, but it was the set and setting. And here, of course, the traditions like the American Indian and the shamanic traditions, we knew all that, but we never listened to it. After I started with psychedelics, suddenly books that I had passed on the bookshelf saying, what a bunch of rot, suddenly became the most treasured volumes for me. Books of American Indian Law, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, things like that, the uh, Upanishads and the Vedas. In other words, it opened our link to the East and to an incredibly rich philosophical, psychological, and spiritual heritage of humanity that we had primarily been close to, except for Max Mueller, just a very few things. It really opened us to the East, and I've been living off it ever since. <laughs> and the way, partly the way it did that was because the chemicals in the psychedelics allowed us to override our habits of thinking. And when we looked around in Western psychology for models about that, they were absent. And when we looked in the East in things like the Vasudhi Maga, there they were, very beautifully articulated. And here were a group of people in the East that we had treated really as almost as barbarians, that had a wisdom about human consciousness that became, and they became our elders. One of them, of course, became a guru. So it opened us to meditation and spiritual practices. Of course, it became faddish in the 70s, but beyond the fads of gurus and all that, there was a deep process, and there is a deep meditative uh, investment in this society at this moment, whether you call it stress reduction or whatever you call it, it's there, and it's growing all the time. And that's part of the result of what happened in the 60s. It opened ways for networking because it opened our horizontal power structures rather than our vertical heart power structures. And that's part of the information age that Tim's talking about now. In a way, it was a precursor of that in allowing us to uh, see vertical institutions as much more ephemeral. And that was the deeper part of the shift that happened then, which I think is the most fundamental shift, which was the shift in our perception of reality. That we, what happened to us was what I think Einstein did to Newton. It went from treating a reality as absolute to seeing that all realities are relative. And the minute you do that, social institutions are up for grabs. That changes the whole ballgame right there. And that is one of the things that has happened, and that is isn't turnable back. And that's part of why there is so much chaos in the moment in the culture because social institutions which kept the structures going are breaking down because people don't value them. In Boston, when I was growing up, on Sunday you went to church. Now on Sunday you go to the shopping mall. That's a difference in values. Family structures broke down. And we don't have to say values, we just have to look at change. And the question is who rides with change and who gets frightened and tries to grab at the old history and this is a moment when changing from absolute reality to relative reality is a tremendous opportunity for growth, and it has a lot of scariness to it. But that's part of what our work is. It, um, that shift of reality started to spread into the world through minstrels like Bob Dylan and like the Jefferson Airplane and the Great the Dead and uh, Rolling Stones and Big Brother and on and on. Um, and it's gotten so far now, I'll tell you how far it's gotten that if I speak now in the Middle West, which I'll be doing in a few weeks when I'm on tour, if I speak in a relatively medium-sized city, I can look at an audience in which 
70 to 80 percent of the audience has never taken psychedelics. They have never read Eastern literature. They've never been to the East. And I can say exactly the same things I said in 1965 or 70, which then were heard by an audience of a few people between 15 and 25, and that audience is going, yes. The audience in the Midwest is saying, yeah, we hear you. Now, how do they hear us? What happened? How did those values get inculcated into the culture? I think because you can't see it, you don't think it exists. But then when you get these little clues around the edge, you begin to see the profundity of what the social changes that were wrought at that point in the 60s. The Grateful Dead now is a major religious uh, ritual. <laughs> The work started really by Eric Cass and people like that way back, beautiful men. Uh, that has done incredibly in terms of awakening us, bringing death out of the closet. And a lot of the way in which now so many people want to work with the dying comes out of that kind of psychedelic process that happened in the 60s. Okay, I uh, think I should say something about the mistakes. Um, <coughs> of the early 60s of our research. Um, in one way, I kind of am with Timothy, what mistakes, it was life, we did the best we could. So I don't say these in some sense of, um, I don't know what sense I say them, then I'll just say them. <laughs> when we did that research at Harvard, very shortly after the beginning, we realized that this was a heresy to that social institution. That the Harvard is an institution committed to the intellect and to rational analytic process. And when we brought on something that dealt with intuitive, transcendent, um, unitive experiences, in which the intellect became a subsystem rather than the metasystem, we were taking on the priest class of the church and we were doing it within the confines of that church. And what we were doing is going on to a football, and to a tennis court with football cleats, the way I would understand it. And I think that once we got going, um, because we were ingesting our own product, we lost our connection with the community around us. And I feel that this was neither our fault nor their fault. It was one of the results of the profundity of this experience that we couldn't turn away and couldn't turn back. But it did, we did lose our support system and we didn't slow down enough to, to keep it with us because it finally got to the point of who's taken it and who hasn't. And that bridge became unbridgeable after a while. And it was shocking to us that people we loved and worked with as colleagues no longer were our colleagues. I think we got a little confused about evolution and revolution. And I think we played with the revolutionary aspect of psychedelics, when to me the far more interesting issue are the evolutionary aspect. And I think that had we been more evolved in our wisdom and not feeling we were inventing the wheel all over again, we would have had an appreciation of what the fears were of the society and how to work with those fears rather than just pitting ourselves against them. I don't think the way we did it was the only way it could have been done. <coughs> I think we were over enthusiastic about how easy behavior change would be. When I look at many of my friends that were that I took acid with in the 60s, I see that there's been a lot of work they've done, but there's a lot yet to do. And I remember Tim and I had a chart on the wall of how soon everybody would get enlightened. It involved putting acid in the water supply, but it still it would be very soon. We talked about...